Good morning, and happy Sabbath. Let's open our Bibles again to Revelation, Revelation eleven fifteen through 19. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple... Of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Now, what do you think we're going to talk about this morning as the final kingdom? You all have to remember, if I don't hear anything out here, I can't talk up here. You think we're going to talk about Babylon or a one world empire? Let's go through and look at these verses in a little more detail. In verse 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Weren't all kingdoms already gods? Okay, yes. Then what's going on here? Okay, not all kingdoms of this world recognize that. So apparently, there's something going on where in some sense, or in someone's perception... They haven't been gods, and God is taking his rightful ownership. Okay? So apparently God has allowed in his sovereignty some situation to be for a period of time where he seemed not to be in charge. But then he's fixing that. And claiming his territory for how long? How does the verse end? who will reign forever and ever. Verse 16. What did the four and twenty elders, the twenty-four elders, what did they do? I'm sorry? They're before God. What did they do in this verse? Fell on their faces and worshipped. Is worship an important issue at the end of time? Just a little bit. (laughs) Those who worship the beast in his image, those who worship God and have his seal. The issue of the Sabbath worship. Worship is a significant issue, as Revelation talks about. Verse 17, how did they worship? Praise. Praise. They gave thanks, right? To who, why? To who and why? To God. God, The Lord God Almighty, who is the Creator. What was that? He is, was, always be. He's eternally existent. What does it say? King James says, because because he has taken his power and reign. He has claimed what is rightfully his. That is a cause for worship and for praise before the universe. Verse 18. What do we see happening in verse 18? Think of when is this happening? Nations are angry. Wrath is come. 
time of the dead that they should be judged, the time that God is going to give reward to his saints, his prophets, his people, but also those who destroy the earth will be destroyed. What time is this referring to? Seven last plagues? plagues? Judgment? The time of the judgment? The determination for all eternity, God's people versus those that are not God's people, those who have destroyed the earth, and them receiving the result of their choices? The end of time, right? Verse 19, what is happening here? We see the temple opened. Okay, investigative judgment. And what is the focal point? The Ark of His Testament, or covenant, right? We were studying the sanctuary this morning. The focal point of the whole sanctuary service is what? It's the box in the middle, right? What was that? Christ Jesus. As we Okay, good. And we're going to talk about that. The focal point in the sanctuary, we were studying the earthly sanctuary in Sabbath school this morning. And it's all a model. It's just an illustration, except what was real was not a type. The presence of God. That was the only thing that wasn't symbolic. The earthly sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary, both the focal point is the actual presence of God. And God, in his incredible, infinite goodness, gave the model, but then, for the most important point, brought the reality of himself. And everything throughout the sanctuary taught about Christ, but the focal point was him himself. And as we see this at the end of time, the Ark of His Testament, what was above the Ark? The mercy seat was part of the Ark. God's presence again, the focal point. And in the ark, his testament, his ten commandments. But it's the ark of his covenant, as well as his testament. Same thing. What's another word for covenant? Promise. It is the ark of his promise, upon which is his presence. So what kingdom are we talking about, the final kingdom? Christ's kingdom, a time when Christ is reclaiming that which is his. At the end of time, the work of salvation is winding up, coming to a close. Let's go back and let's look at some of the clearest examples of kingdoms. Let's turn to Matthew. Now, John the Baptist was preparing the way for Christ's first coming, right? We're turning to Matthew 3. Preparing the way for Christ's first advent. He was the forerunner. Aren't we preparing the way for his second coming? Heard one amen. Yes. Matthew 3, 2. What was John's message? John was saying, repent. Get your act together. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What was Jesus' message? Let's turn a couple pages to Matthew 4. And of course, Jesus had a different message, right? Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach. It's the beginning of his ministry. And what did he say? Same thing. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you think maybe that's kind of important to understand? I think probably so. Do we understand it very well? I know growing up in a church culture, we throw around a lot lot of phrases that we tend not to really understand. 
What is this all about? What does it mean, at hand? Close. So this means, let's see, heaven, the place is behind the door over there. It's here. Okay, so heaven, the place is right here. Isn't that what heaven means? Okay, there might be different meanings. Let's keep going. At hand, in different versions, the RSV says, is at hand. NIV says, is near. Um, Another version says, has arrived. New English says, is upon you. Interlinear says, has drawn near. The kingdom of heaven is near. It's close. It's next to you. It's right here. Isn't it wherever Christ is at? Yes. Yes. The temple following Solomon's wasn't as nice, but it was greater because Christ himself came to it. By the way, what is a kingdom? That might be important as we talk about it. Has to have a ruler. Have to have subjects. It's what of the king? The subjects of the king. Locality where he rules over. Rules, regulations. It might be part of a kingdom. The word itself, put it into two words. King, dumb, or dominion. A king's dominion where a king has dominion, where the king, the person in rulership authority, is the one in charge, the one that governs, that calls the shots, how things are, everybody follows his lead. Kingdom, where one king has authority, rulership. Okay, let's go on a little bit. Matthew 6. What did Jesus say was the most important thing for a human being to pursue, to put their effort into in their life? Matthew 6.33. Even more important than food and clothing, the verses before this. What is even more important than our food and our clothing? 6.33. Seek ye first the... Kingdom, what kingdom? Of God. And what? And his righteousness. And what's going to happen? All the rest comes along with it. The rest will be taken care of. Verse 34, this is hard for us, and it says basically, because of this, don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. There's enough to worry about today. Amen. (laughs) Amen. So seek first the kingdom of God more than the clothes you're going to wear, more than the food you're going to eat. This is the most important thing, to seek where one king has soul, dominion, and authority. Now, let's go on a little bit further. Matthew 24. What has to happen before Christ can come back the second time? Most of us are pretty familiar with this, but we may not have thought about it and some of the meaning and some of the terms we're talking about. Matthew 24, 14. What's going to happen before the end shall come? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. We miss the next phrase. For a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. So we have the gospel, the good news of 
the kingdom, again, the kingdom concept here, shall be preached or taught or proclaimed in all the world. How? For a witness. What does that mean? You always just read right over that. In one ear, out the other. For a witness. What does that mean? It must be pretty important. It's here talking about what has to happen before the second coming. Witnessing the character of Christ and his people. For a witness. Just one moment. The word witness means something evidential. In other words, evidence given, or specifically, this is interesting, the Decalogue as in the sacred tabernacle. That was a witness. Ten Commandments are a witness. But this is evidence given, evidential. It's obvious. The gospel of the kingdom, the good news of Christ's sole authority is to be communicated in an evidential way where evidence is given. It is obvious to those who are seeing, perceiving what the gospel is about. And that's where it ties in with some statements about when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, he will come to claim them as his own. The gospel must be, must be communicated in an evidential way, where the evidence is obvious in his people. And again, the Ten Commandments, God puts them where? He's promised, in his new covenant promise, to write his law in our hearts, in our minds, so that we then live out those principles. And then the end will come. Now, when Christ came the first time, everyone really got the message, they really understood the kingdom of heaven, right? Christ came preaching the kingdom of heaven. And they said, ah, right on, he's got it. Mm -hmm. We understand it. No. (laughs) No, period. (laughs) Wrong. That's not how it was, right? Obviously not. He had a lot of resistance. And who did he have the most resistance from? his own people, the spiritual leaders? Were they worse than ignorant? Yeah, they were blatantly opposed. They were worse than ignorant. They had the wrong ideas of what following God was all about. And they were a hindrance. Do you suppose it might be important for us to maybe get this straight before the second coming? I think very important. Yes. Yes, somebody witnessed to them. It's very important that we are not fuzzy on some of the basic principles of the kingdom of God. Before we can preach the kingdoms, we have to understand the kingdom to communicate it. Now, what is the kingdom? Let's look at Romans 14. Romans 14, verse 17. Question, what is the kingdom of God? In different Gospels, some use the kingdom of heaven, some put it in terms of the kingdom of God, referring to the same thing. Romans 14, 17, what is the kingdom? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, what did the Pharisees think the kingdom was? Prestige, wealth, power, pinning their handkerchief to their garment on Sabbath so they wouldn't work, what they ate and drank, which is what the verse talks about, which is important for our health, very clearly in other places, but when we make that what the kingdom consists of, it's a big problem. It's to help us in our pursuit of the kingdom. Well, 
What about the promises? Okay. Okay. Asking God. In this verse, what type of things are righteousness, peace, and joy? They're tangible things we can pick up like this, right? It's the conditions of our heart or our mind. It's a condition of the heart or mind that constitutes the kingdom. Where is the kingdom? Let's look at Luke 17. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. Where is the kingdom? And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So where is the kingdom? It's within us. It's in our heart, in our minds. Yes, there is a place, heaven, but the kingdom of God that is really the focal point is within us. It's our minds, our hearts. Here's a funny question. How is the kingdom? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 4. First Corinthians 4.20 For the kingdom of God is not in what? In words. It's not in what we talk. It's not in our speech. It's not saying the right things. Knowing the right facts. But it's in what? In power. Power where? Within us, in our minds. Moral power and excellence of soul. I like that. Whose power? God's power through the Holy Spirit. Power in the form of righteousness, peace, and joy, specifically. How powerful does it have to be for us to have peace and joy in the middle of our troubles? It's a miracle. (laughs) And I don't think I'm unique in having a lot of trials and tribulations and afflictions. But to have peace in that, like we just read in our worship with our kids this morning about the storm on the sea, you know, when Christ was in the boat and how Christ was sleeping, the waves crashing over them and the boat going all over the place, he was sleeping, the boat sinking. That's the witness, that's the evidence that he had peace. Christ, yeah, the Holy Spirit's a comforter. So he could have, as we can, a miraculous peace in the middle of incredible turmoil. Amen. That's good news as far as I'm concerned. Amen. So as we go through life and we find ourselves troubled, that's a signal you need the power for the peace and the joy. You need God to exercise his dominion in his kingdom with a power that we don't have. Now, back to our original question. What kingdom is the final kingdom? It's us. As we look at the great controversy, before the universe, Christ is reclaiming planet Earth. What is the last portion 
to be reclaimed, to come under his rulership, our individual lives. Yeah. He's won the battles, he's won the victories, and the last part that's yet to be determined is here. Is here. And that's, Chris, thank you for reading that this morning from the bulletin. That fits in so well with this about how we cannot wait until the judgment before we consent to deny ourselves and lift the cross. We cannot then form characters for heaven. It is here in this life that we have to make these decisions, these determinations, that we have to have God's kingdom practically working in us and there being the evidence in our persons of his presence. That's what has to happen before the end can come. Now, we're just going to, there's a number of basic principles of the kingdom. We're just going to talk about a couple of them. But I would encourage you to study this further yourself to understand the principles of the kingdom. You can't have anything more important than this, according to Jesus. And we throw around terms like grace and faith and sin and salvation. Do we know what that means? What is sin in essence, in principle? What really is grace? If I really have grace, what will be the evidence of it? That I have received it and accepted it? We have to understand these principles. Are alcoholics and drug addicts sinners? (laughs) of course not exclusively (laughs) we all are that's a good question are people who habitually sin are they addicts regardless of what it is that's part of the sin problem at a fundamental level How many people have ever worked with alcoholics or drug addicts? A fair number. If you've worked with any programs, Alcoholics Anonymous, whatever, what is the most important fundamental principle for those people to get better? Admission. They have to realize they have a problem. Do you know how many people are alcoholics that deny they have a problem? It is incredible. At the VA hospital down in Loma Linda, they had a pretty big program. The denial that those people were in was unbelievable. It was incredible. The lengths they went to to not face their problems. Some of them were just burying emotional pain with the drugs. I still remember one guy I got to be good friends with who was doing heroin. Had a regular job doing business, accounting stuff, but he was shooting up heroin. He'd been in Vietnam, and the stuff he had done, he couldn't live with. So he was shooting up heroin to calm that pain down. Fortunately, he found relief through Christ with that, and then became part of helping other people that were addicts. There's a way to deal with that other than the drugs and addictions. But the first principle is admission and honesty. I see that in medicine as well. People don't like to admit some of their medical problems. I still remember when I was doing my internship, I was in the emergency department admitting a man to the hospital. His wife was there. I was talking to her about what had been going on. And while I'm talking to her, she's holding her chest. I said, are you okay? And what's, what's going on? Oh, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, you know. No, no, what, what's, what's happening here? Why are you holding your chest? Oh, it, you know, it kind of hurts, but it's, it's nothing, you know. No, what, what's... I finally got out of her what was going on, what she was feeling. Called the nurse over, I said, we need to get this lady plugged in and get her evaluated. She may be having a heart attack. So the nurse took her, got her plugged in, she ended up getting admitted to the hospital. 
She didn't want to admit what was going on with herself. Could have cost her a life. Maybe, maybe not. There's a story of a young man who was coming back from Vietnam. He was in San Francisco. He called his parents on their farm in the Midwest. Mom and Dad, I'm back in the States. Going to be coming home. I have a buddy that I'd like to bring home. I'd like him to live with us. But you need to know he lost an arm and a leg in the war. Mom and Dad says, well, that's great. He's welcome to come visit, but you now he really can't stay. I've got a farm. I can only really have able-bodied people around. You know, you'll just have to pass that on. They didn't hear from their son for a couple days, and they got a call. We need you to come identify your son. They flew out to San Francisco. And they went to the morgue. Sure enough, it was their son. Minus one arm and one leg. How important is honesty? To be able to talk about reality, where we're at, what's going on. No progress can happen without that basis in reality. One of the fundamental issues in the kingdom is our being able to be honest with ourselves and with each other. And churches that have that sense and experience of the grace of God are okay to share their troubles with each other. And I'm afraid we have a big lack of that. And there's great strength there that is possible to be able to share with each other where we're hurting, where we're struggling, where we're failing, where there's a skeleton in our closet that we want to get rid of. We have to be safe to be honest. The other principles, study. Understand what each of them is. And as I was studying this, I came to realize the role in experiencing the kingdom that affliction plays. And I know that I have tended to really, how do I say it, view affliction as an enemy. This shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be this way. To fight against it. Christ says, in this world, you will have trouble. It's just how it is. But that light affliction works for us, what? A far more exceeding weight of glory. That affliction is part of the process of the molding and the purifying. And I'm coming to the, how do I say experiential conclusion that to not struggle against that affliction it's going to be much easier to have peace on a day-to-day basis. To just realize that that's part of life and it's okay. God's in charge. He's going to walk me through it. The ship can't sink because he's in it. And he has it under control. So as we pursue the kingdom, first and foremost, as we put our eyes on Christ, we can have all of these things living out in our lives. We can be okay to be honest with ourselves and with each other. We can know that Christ will give us that inner strength we need at every step, that he will teach us everything we need for his kingdom to be a reality at the end of time in us, in how we think and how we feel, which is a miracle of miracles. 
that we can taste that love and that grace. We can know that part of heaven now. And in particular, I hope we can have that those principles lived out among us, in between us, as brothers and sisters. I was talking with one church member here in the last week or so, and she was uh, you know, sharing some of the things she's really struggling with and having a hard time. And she's like, she made a point, be sure you don't tell anybody. You know, I don't want anybody else to know about this because I'm going to get criticized for this and this and this. She was afraid of the pain she would find coming back to her through other church members because of their attitudes and perspectives and their words, instead of being a strength to her. We can't have that tragedy. 